Last week was Easter. We're about as half as full as we were last week. But what a praise it was to see how full we were in this building. That was a great encouragement to me, and I'm grateful. But we who are alive and remain, <laughs> who are here this morning, we carry on the celebration of Easter, don't we? Because we don't celebrate the resurrection on just a simple day. We celebrate it every day. Our whole faith hinges on who our God is, that he lives and he is Lord. You remember that sermon last week, we talked about the covenant name of God, who is Lord Jehovah. And we spoke about all the different names that were given to him through the Old Testament that talked about his promises and who he was and how we related that to why we celebrate the resurrection because we believe Jesus is that Lord of the Old Testament alive and well today. The Lord our provider, the Lord our healer, the Lord our banner, the Lord who is there, right? The Lord who sees all these different things. And I want to encourage you, if you missed that message last week, it's on YouTube. You can search that or you can find it on the Facebook page. Go back and listen to that. Not because I'm such a great preacher, but because it's such a great message. Amen? Yeah, I think I'm going to take that as an amen. But back in Romans, where we left off as we take this walk through Romans, I want to remind you of the last verse we ended on in chapter 10. And it was Paul quoting a verse from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2. He says this, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. We left chapter 10 off with that word. All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and an obstinate people. I don't know about you, but I have seen myself as disobedient and obstinate at times. And I am very grateful that all day long God has stretched out his hands over me and does not give up on me. But though I find that applicable to me, what he was referring to was the, the Jewish people. I want to remind you who Paul is writing to as he writes the book of Romans. He is writing to a Roman people, a Gentile people. And in the church of that day, there in Rome, there was some, well, what's the word? Maybe not animosity, maybe not that bad, but certainly some division between the Jewish people and the Gentile people. The Jews, of course, upset that these Gentiles would receive the blessings of God through what they would say is a Jewish Messiah. So there was certainly some some aggravation there, but the Gentiles dealing with their own pride and saying, well, God has chosen us now over the Jew. And Paul is going to use chapter 11, where we're going to be today. So if you want to turn there with me, join me in Romans chapter 11. Paul is going to talk about the fact that God is not done with the Jewish people. And we need to be careful today... As Gentiles, you and I, pagans, as it were, that we not take for granted the people that God originally chose. You know, they're going to pay, play a big part in God's purpose and his plan. And they still do, by the way. I think that's why it's so important that even we as a nation ought to bless Israel and support Israel. Because I believe God has not forsaken his promise that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. We need to make sure we're on the right side of that. Amen. But we need to be reminded that God is not done with Israel. God is not done with the Jewish people. Though we get to receive the blessings of a Jewish Messiah, we get to receive salvation and we can stand here. Do we have any Jews in the room, by the way? Honestly. No, I didn't think so. Okay, so we're a bunch of Gentiles. We need to remember that we serve a Jewish Messiah. And the Jews are still God's chosen people. Now I'm grateful that we are grafted in. And we get to get into that passage next week. But as we start Romans chapter 11, Paul makes this very clear. He says in verse 1, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? And of course, the obvious answer, Paul is not asking the question so that he can get letters back to answer that question. He is writing in such a way, grammatically, as to presuppose the answer is, of course, 
May it never be. Absolutely not. God has not rejected his people. And I'm grateful for that. Amen? Because that doesn't speak to how great the people are. That speaks to how great God is. And how patient God is. How long-suffering God is. And that means a lot to me because I serve that patient, long-suffering, great, good, glorious God. I'm grateful he doesn't reject his people. And Paul is reminding us that he doesn't for, he hasn't rejected his people. He still has a plan for his people. He's not finished with his people. And Paul, being the primary example of that fact, and he goes on in verse 1, he says, Look at me. I, too, am an Israelite. I am a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has called me and used me. He saved me. And here I am preaching to you. Paul is living proof that God has not rejected the Jew. So Paul, in the next few verses, and I think we're going down to verse 16 today. And listen, there's much more to the context of this passage, but I couldn't fit it all in at one sermon, so we are breaking it apart. But he's going to show us in the, the part of the passage that we're going to be in today, three things about God's promises and God's purposes for his people. First thing he's going to show us is that the Lord always has a remnant. He always has a remnant. Look at verse 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. He's not rejected his people. Now that is not to say that people have not rejected him. Amen. We see that all throughout the Old Testament as he instructs his people, as he gives promises to his people, as he prophesies to his people and leads them to the promised land. As they're in the promised land and they still rebel and reject his statutes, they go into exile. So many ups and downs for the Jewish people all the way into the New Testament, even to the point of the Messiah walking among his people, the Jewish people, dying for all of their sins, but nevertheless, they rejected him and crucified him. Amen? But God did not reject them. We need to get this straight. God does not reject people. Amen? People reject him. I think that's a vast truth that we need to really grasp when it comes to who is saved and who's not saved. People aren't saved because God has rejected them, but because they have rejected him. Look in the rest of verse 2. Or do you, not, do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Here is Elijah, a prophet of God, called to the people of God to deliver the message of God. And what did he encounter? Oftentimes he encountered a stubborn and obstinate people, the same people that God is stretching his hands over. Amen? And I think of any pastor behind any pulpit or any preacher who proclaims the message, each of us deal with that at some point. We think, man, I'm just preaching and preaching and preaching. It just seems like they're not getting it. They're not getting it. And here Elijah is, having preached so much, finding himself alone, and he cries out to God, says, God, I cannot deal with this. I'm the only one left. I don't, have you ever felt like you were just the only one? Nobody gets it. How does that? Anybody, how, how do people not get it? I'm the only one to get. How prideful is that? How prideful is it to think that you are so special that you're the only one that gets it? But this is where Elijah's at. Paul is bringing this up. He is at the point where he said, I, they, they have killed all your prophets. They've torn down your altars. And I alone am left, am left. And they're seeking my life. Man, they're after me. It's all about me. He felt abandoned. Verse 4. But what is the divine response to him? What did God say back to Elijah? Chill out, dude. Just in paraphrase. It does not say, chilleth out, dude, in the King James. But his response is, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God said, there are others. You are not by yourself, O ye of little faith. You are not alone in this. I have a faithful few. 
Now, I want you to understand the difference of the faithful few. It's not that God had rejected all but this few, but rather that this few are the ones that did not reject God. They didn't bow the knee to Baal. They didn't go after these other gods. Baal, Baal. You pronounce it in Hebrew and you get back with me, all right? But these faithful few. Now, it says that there were what? 8,000 or 7,000? 7,000 men. Now you say, well, that sounds like quite a few. Not in the vast mass of Israel who were, who were alive back then. I mean, these are certainly a few. When you think of the population of Israel at the time, I mean, we're talking a very, very small portion, but nevertheless, a portion of faithful few. I think this is a reflection of what we see in Matthew chapter 7. And I say it all the time from the pulpit. But God said there are going to be many who take that wide road to destruction. And only few that will find the narrow path to life. Right? It's that same balanced scale there. There's going to be many who turn away. But there's always going to be a few who are faithful who are there. Can I encourage you this morning? We are not alone. And I like to bring this in the context of today, but understand, once again, we're talking about the context of Israel, the context of the Jew. Paul is talking about Elijah, who even himself felt completely abandoned by his people. But God said, no, I have a remnant. I have not given up on my people. Verse 5, in the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. God is still using his people. Once again, Paul being a prime example, but there were certainly churches all over the realm of that time filled with Jewish believers. Those who had not rejected their Messiah, but saw the Messiah for who they were, and they surrendered their lives to them, and they became born again. They became Christians, Jew, Jewish Christians. Amen? And so God is still using them. He says, according to God's grace is choice. Verse 6, but if it's by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. This is key. Because the Jew of that day comes to Christ, comes to their Messiah, comes to salvation the same way the Gentile comes to salvation, by grace through faith. And God did that on purpose. To let the Jew know that these dirty Gentiles can receive salvation the same way they receive salvation. And these Gentiles can't get too heady about who they are because they have to come to faith the same way the Jewish people have to come to the Lord by faith, by grace. There is a great unity that God is working through, although he has not given up on his people, the Jewish people. He desires unity. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How important it is that we find unity. The Lord always has a remnant. He shows us in this passage as well that the Lord has a reason for everything. We're always looking for the reason, aren't we? The reason why things are the way they are. The reason that we are in the, station, in the situation that we find ourselves in. Paul gives us some of the reason in verse 7. What then? Another question that he's going to answer right away. What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. You say, you tell me that God has hardened some and chosen others? Well, we went through this and back in chapter 9, didn't we? The whole, the whole situation of those who were hardened and those who were chosen depends on what? Not on God's desire to harden their heart. But back in chapter 9, we were given the, or the example of Pharaoh. Pharaoh who rejected God over and over and over until the point God said, all right, you're done. The difference between those who were chosen and those who were hardened is in what they were seeking. He says that in verse 7, those who were chosen obtained it, the rest were hardened. What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. What was Israel seeking? That's the key to understanding who was hardened. And we are actually told that again in Romans chapter 9, verses 31 and 32. Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were through works. 
In other words, God has laid out the path over and over and over again, stretching out his arms over this rebellious and obstinate people, saying, all along, just trust me. Put your faith in me. And all along the way, the people were saying, no, I got this. I will earn my way into the kingdom. And Christ comes along preaching a message, a gospel of repentance and saying, stop trying to earn it. You can never earn it yourself. Put your faith in me. And they over and over rejected and rejected. And by the way, were hardened. Can I remind you that God desires that none should perish, that all should come to repentance. He desires all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so, yes, there were some that were hardened by God's hand. Why? Because they kept rebelling and refusing and rejecting their Messiah. Verse 8, just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Paul is quoting the prophecy that God had given his people way back in Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 4, as well as in Isaiah chapter 29 verse 10. Talking to a people who were over and over rebellious, God was one day going to say, hey, you are so rebellious, you are so callous, you are going to be at the point where the truth is going to be right in front of you, right in front of your face, and you just won't be able to get it. And, of course, we see that in Jesus' ministry as he preaches to these Jewish crowds and he talks about and fulfills prophecy right in front of them. He, he speaks the scriptures and the scriptures come alive through him and they see it and they taste it and they feel it. They are completely experienced the promises of God right in front of them. But they walk away angry, bitter, mad, murderous. And we think, how could they not get it? How could they be so blind? Because their hearts have been hardened, as God said it would be. God has a reason for the things that he does. Amen? In verse 11, I say then, they did not stumble as so, so as to fall, did they? Paul is saying here, listen, yes, they have rebelled, they have hardened their hearts, they are blind to the truth over and over and over again. We can preach the gospel and a lot of them just don't seem to get it, but don't get it wrong. God has not given up on his people. God has not thrown the Jew away in light of the Gentile. God is not done with his people. They are still his people created for his glory, his purpose. The ones in which the promises flow, the prophecies flow. They were giving all of those things. And by the way, they still have those things. And they are vital. If you read through Revelation, you'll notice it centers very much around Israel. And in fact, the heavens and the earth that you and I look to today... The one that, you know, listen, I look forward to the day when I get a new body. I'm at the point where I bend over when I bend over. I, one foot has to go with me up. Just so it doesn't bend my back so much. Because my back hurts. I'm looking forward to a day when I get a new body. And I get to get out of this old crummy world. And all the pains and the hurts and the sweat and the toil. And all the things that this world has to offer. I get to get out of it and I get to step into a kingdom. But the Bible promises me one day God is going to set up a new kingdom. You know what he's going to call it? New Jerusalem. Modeled after the place and the people that he chose. God's not done with the Jewish people. He's not done with Israel. I say that they did not stumble as to fall, did they? May it never be. But listen to this. By their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. In other words, even through their rejection, God used it to bring salvation to us today. Can I get a hallelujah? hallelujah. I mean, amen. They rejected, they rebelled, they disobeyed, and it worked out for our benefit. Yet another proof in what God, he told us in Romans 
8.28 that he works all things together for good. You know, that's another thing that distracts, I think, the average believer. We get so frustrated, at least I get frustrated, and other people say, man, they just won't listen. They won't abide, abide in your word. They won't apply your word. When your word tells them they could be blessed and this church could be something great if we would all do what the Bible says. And I get frustrated and I've got to think, oh, God, you're going to use it all anyway. Listen, he wants every one of us to submit to his word, to obey his word, to follow him faithfully. But listen, even if we, some of us, or even I myself, stray or rebel and mess something up, guess what? God's still going to use it for his glory. And he's telling these, Paul is telling this Gentile church, yeah, the Jews made a big mistake. They crucified their own Messiah, their own Savior. But guess what? It worked out for you, didn't it? He had a reason for it. But not only that, he goes on to say there, their transgression has become salvation to the Gentiles, but also to make them jealous. Who's them? The Jewish people. In other words, the Gentiles being saved is going to be work to get back to the Jew. God's even got a reason for that. They messed up. We got saved. We got saved. Making them jealous. Jealous isn't always a bad thing. Amen. Can I tell you, God's jealous for his bride and his people, his church. That's a good thing. The thing that makes jealousy bad is if we take jealousy the wrong direction. I can be jealous for the church and want the best for the church. Or I can be jealous of the church and be angry at the church. Do you see the difference? One stirs me to do better. The other stirs me to rebel in anger. But the reason... That so much has happened through the Jewish people. All their rebellion, all their sin, all their transgression, all the things that led Jesus to the cross worked out for my salvation. But guess what? God's going to also work it out back for their salvation. The Lord always has a remnant. The Lord has a reason. And finally this morning, the Lord has the riches in his kingdom. Verse 12. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world... And their failure is riches for the Gentile, which is exactly what we just got done talking about. Everything that they messed up, we benefited from. Amen. But if we would benefit so greatly from what they got wrong, how much more will their fulfillment be? How much greater will it be for them who are entrusted with the promises and the prophecies of people of God who accept their Messiah, who receive his salvation? They will be fulfilling God's purpose. They were created for kingdom riches. They were created for the kingdom that God has set to prepare, that we get to hope into. They were created for it, for faith and for salvation. Verse 13. But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. Paul is saying, because of your salvation, I want to make it my intention to move them to jealousy. Why? For their salvation, for God's will, for God's glory, that they would fulfill what God has planned for them all along. I want to use you Gentiles to save the Jews. How many of you have witnessed this last week? Listen, we don't encounter very many Jews. We often take for granted the Jews as God's people. How many of you even thought of the Jewish people? How many of you even thought of Israel this last week if it hasn't been in the news? And by the way, I don't know that they've been in the news much. we got a whole lot going on right here in our own country and over in Russia and Ukraine. We haven't given much thought to Israel. But maybe we ought to, amen? Maybe we ought to be a little bit more prayerful. A little bit more excited to live out this faith that we have been gifted because of them. Verse 15. For their reject rejection is the reconciliation of the world. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Eternal riches of life. I'll bring up that verse again. The, the thief comes to steal, kill, steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life. Don't you want abundant life? God's purpose is abundant life. 
But we need to make sure we have that perspective. He doesn't necessarily mean abundant life here on this earth. He's saying life. Life is, uh, is explained in who he is. Presence of God with us. That is life. Abundant life is found in Christ. The riches of life is found in Christ. What will their acceptance be? The Jewish people, the promised people, if they accept that life. Verse 16, if the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. If the root is holy, the branches are too. Can I tell you this morning, we are not the root and we are not the first lump of dough. We are the after. We came after. We need to put that in perspective. God has used the Jew from the beginning and he's called them and promised through them. We get to receive the benefits because of them. And I'm grateful. But they were the first lump of dough. They were the root. But even so, riches flow through that lump. Riches flow through that, that root. And it flows to us today. How? Because of the connecting tissue that binds us with the Jewish people today, that is Jesus himself, where he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We find our center with the Jewish people right there at the Messiah, at the cross, by grace through faith. They are no worse than us, and we are no better than they. But God is not done with them at all. And though they are the chosen people of God, destined for the purpose and fulfillment of God's promises on this earth, we find salvation in the same place as John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 says, As many as have received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe. In his name. I believe in the God of Israel today. And I believe he is still the God of Israel today. I believe he's not done with Israel today. And one of the important things of going through scripture and reading his word. Not is just to get a practical application for us for life. But also to remember who God is speaking to and why he speaks and what's coming up next. And by the way, the rapture is coming up next. But God's not done with the Jewish people. And they're in for a rough ride. So is everybody else who has not received Christ. But there are going to be many who are saved. I want to tell you there's always a remnant. Sometimes we may feel alone in our walk with Christ. I want you to know there's always a remnant. There's a Jewish remnant out there today. There are still Jews who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. That follow him. That serve him. We need to keep them in prayer. We need to pray for Israel today. That the Lord would bless them. Protect them against their enemies. Guide them that they would be unhardened. God is still stretching his hand over them. Amen. He's not giving up on them. Just like he's not giving up on us here today. And I'm thankful for that as well. So let's live out of faith that not only says, thank you, Lord, for what you've given me. Let's live out of faith that says, God, you have a purpose and a plan, not just for me, not just for your church, but for the nation of Israel. Can I remember them in my prayers and blessings for them as well? Let us not get so high and mighty to think as we are, we are the only ones. And let's remember where riches flow from. Flows from the vine. We're just branches. We're not going to get those branches unless we're attached to the vine. You know, Jesus said, abide in me. If you're in my word, if you know my word, you will abide in me. The truth will be in you and the truth will set you free. How do you abide? You abide daily. I'm not talking about salvation. I believe once saved, always saved. But I believe we have to abide daily for the blessings, for the riches. And some of us have slacked on abiding, I think. We abide by trusting in him day after day. We wake up and say, God, I'm going to abide in you today. I'm going to trust in you today. 
I want to be a conduit of blessing today. I want you to flow your riches into me so I can flow them out into the world. You can only do that by abiding in him. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't do it on your own. You weren't meant to do it on your own. We entrust in the one who's in control this morning.